You know, no, no matter what happens to you in your life, there's a future and a hope. There's always a future and a hope. In our mother's room down the back, there's a canvas Kylie's painted that we've got to decorate our mother's room. And also Kylie's uh, written a couple of songs and one of those songs is Not Yet, I think it's called, and it's on this album. And uh, we've got those, this album down the back. It's just something Kylie's put together. It's amazing. If you want to hear a little more of that story, and, and there's uh, these albums down the back, they're $10, and uh, just to support Kylie would be great as well, wouldn't it? It's great. You know, Easter's about Jesus activa- activating the future and hope in you. Good Friday is when Jesus declared, and at the cross, he declared, it is finished. He's declared it's over, it's done. Uh, and But that's actually only part of the story, and we know that's part of the story. Finished on the old life, but then on the cross, when he rose again from the dead, the new beginning started. That it's just begun, and, and the reality is it just begun on Easter Sunday. Now, you, you know, you matter so much to God. I love the, the scripture, and we probably know it so well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross. He gave his only son for you. There's a story and there's a saying on, you see a lot at Easter time, when Jesus was on the cross, he had you on his mind. And it's so true if we can capture what God wanted to do on the cross. He wanted us to know God. He made a way. The cross and the resurrection was about making a way to know God, not just know of him, not just have this thought about him, not just to gather all the information, but the place to actually have a relationship. He made a way for relationship. He made a way that you'll know God, that you'll find freedom. Who wants freedom? We want freedom. It's one of the desires of the world. We want freedom. And Jesus made a way to know God and find freedom. That's what happened at Easter. You matter so much to God. We've got a T-shirt that gets worn. You'll see them around. It says, you matter. And you do. You matter to God. You matter to God so much that Jesus would go to the cross and rise again, that he would conquer death, that you can find and know God and find freedom. This Easter, I'd love you to just take you on a journey through the eyes of three separate people who we don't usually talk about at Easter. So I want to try and paint a little bit of a picture in a different way this Easter. Because you probably all know the Easter message. If you don't know the Easter message, this is the Easter message. Jesus died and rose again. For you. Simple. But let's have a look at it from three different angles this morning. In the context of 0 AD... So right now we're going back to the beginning of 0 AD. Jesus has died. But we understand that when he was born, Mary was there. Now picture Mary. I I, want to have a look at Mary this morning. Mary was a young lady, probably around 13 years old, 14 years old, something around that. And an angel turned up and said to her, Hey, Mary, um... I'm going to overshadow you. You're going to get pregnant. Now, you imagine the story of that. Here's Mary, 13-year-old, just a teenager, comes into mum and says, hey, mum, guess what? (laughs) What would you say as mum? Uh-huh. Imaginary friends. And there she is, and she's she's then falls pregnant to Jesus, to God. And Joseph, her husband, he was a good man and and the Bible records that he was actually going to continue to marry her even though she was pregnant and it wasn't him. But you can imagine him going to his dad and said, hey, dad, it's not me. (laughs) And he said, "I'll, I'll take her in, then I'll divorce her quietly because there was a lot of shame around that. And... I I picture this whole life with Mary and and what she went through. She was a good girl. The Bible says she was highly favoured. God favoured her. She wasn't a bad girl. She was a good girl. So she wouldn't have experienced what she was about to experience. She wouldn't experience the rejection. She would never have experienced that. She was a good girl, loved, probably brought up in a really good home. 
And then all of a sudden, she's got a bump. And she ends up going back to Bethlehem. Because what had happened, then you know the Christmas story, they ended up back at Bethlehem because there was a census going on. So she's there. Now, if you understand the families of those times, there would have been lots of family members at Bethlehem. Lots of them. They would have been all come back to Bethlehem because everyone had to come home. They would have all gone back to their place where they were born. So the family was there. You would have thought they would have thrown out the airbag for Mary, wouldn't it? Like, honestly, if, if, you, if it were your place and someone had come home, you'd throw out the airbag, wouldn't you? At the very least. And given that she was nine months pregnant, you might even say, why don't you have our bed? But she was rejected. No room, not only in the inn, there was no room in anyone else's house. Rejected. Gave birth in a stable. Doesn't sound like she had much faith with the family, does it? And maybe you're in this place and you've been rejected. Maybe you've, you're a good person and you've made a decision to follow Jesus and all of a sudden the family said, no, 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 no. And you're feeling that rejection. I, I want you to know at Easter, God wants to do some things for you today. Sometimes God's asked you to do things and the whole world doesn't understand. Your family doesn't understand. I remember when Moira and I came home to our family, we were married, two kids, uh, had a fantastic job, awesome job, I loved it, Australian manager of a company, CEO, earning incredible money, beautiful, perfect house we just bought, was lovely, we were renovating it to make it our dream home, we had the weekend, we had a boat, we had the expensive car, You, in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of our family, hey, yeah, they're not bad, poster children. And we come home and said, guess what? God said to us, we're going to Bible college. Moira's parents were, and we heard this around the family grapevine that comes around, they've joined a cult. <laughs> They're going to give all their money away. It's funny how perception comes. See, sometimes God's asked you to do something and you just don't, un they, people don't understand the call of God. See, no matter what happened to you, good or bad, the circumstances and the promises of God are always yes and amen. God always wants to prosper you. No matter what your start in life was, no matter what your circumstances, Easter is a reminder that the promises of God for you, incredible promises for you. I want you to understand that the people I want to talk to out of Mary this morning is the people that have said yes to follow Jesus. The people that have said, yeah, I've gone into ministry, I've given my life to something. And you've been some pressure around you and there's been, you're feeling pressure and you're feeling like, have I done the right thing? I know in Mary's life, the Bible records, she was struggling with things. It said that she went to and kept things in her heart, put things away in her heart because she was actually struggling with what was going on. She had this incredible promise, incredible promise that she's going to birth the saviour of the world, the Messiah, incredible promise. But it wasn't quite going to plan. It wasn't quite going to plan going back to Bethlehem and giving birth in a stable. You'd actually have a bit of a chat to your husband, wouldn't you? Come on, darling, I thought you would have at least booked the inn beforehand. <laughs> the only job you had to do. Have anyone ever experienced that as a man? <laughs> yeah. You only got one thing to do. You give them two things to do. That's it. I'm talking about myself. But Mary put these things away in her heart. And then... All of a sudden at Easter, here it is, the promise that she was given was put on a cross. What would be going on in Mary's mind? All of my life I've given to this child who was supposed to be the Messiah and he's on a cross. But I want you to go back to the beginning and Back when Jesus was born, when you hear the stories of the Magdi or the kings that came to visit Jesus, because if you've been and you've decided to follow Jesus and you've decided to go into ministry, God is a God of provision. God will make a way when men, there is, when their men says there is no way. You, you, know, you can imagine they had nothing. It says they gave two turtle doves because they had nothing. But all of a sudden, God made a way. And, and there's a guy called uh, Peter Daniels 
And he commissioned a team of historians, he's an Australian guy, he commissioned a team of historians to research the Magdi and the gifts that they brought to Jesus when he was born. We see it as three wise men, but that's probably not true. It actually doesn't mention how many wise men there were or Magdi's there were in Scripture. There was three gifts, but there was more than that. So the research is this. Their conclusion was that 300 kings came bearing gifts for Jesus. And their calculated wealth was over 4 million by today's standards. This is about 10, 15 years ago, so it's more than that now. He said, he said that in Persian documents showed that the gift was escorted by an army. And the reference in Matthew chapter 2 regarding Herod and the people being troubled was because they supposedly thought it was an invading army. See, God had provided, in, in, in our terms, about $4 million, $5 million. That's, that's not a bad baby shower. If you're pregnant, see the parents. Um, the, it, it's just, you know, you, you start to think about what God actually provides. And if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, if you've made a decision to say, I, I'm going into ministry, I'm going to do what God's called me to do, whether it's in the mission field, whether it's in your workplace, God is a God of provision. He's a God of provision and he wants to make a way for you. If you're doing what God has asked you to do, he will provide for you. I think if we look at Mary, we can see that incredible provision that God made. I want to have a look at another person this morning. That person is Peter. I like Peter. I relate to Peter really well. Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends, so he wandered along with Jesus a lot. He was there in all the circumstances. He was there when he was the one that walked on the water. He was the one that was in the Garden of Gethsemane and pulled out the sword and cut the ear off. I like him. He was the guy that always had his foot in his mouth. He always saying something he regretted. He'd always got to that point and thought, oh, maybe you know some people like that. This is the same Peter who rebuked Jesus. And Jesus turned around to him and said, get behind me, Satan. That Peter. Maybe you feel like you've let God down. Peter would have been incredibly gutted at that time. He was a, he's a, a gagacious personality. You read about his story. He's a, what we call an eye personality, an influencer. Uh, he's charismatic. He's that type of guy. And he's a people person and he's a people pleaser. And when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, he would have been gutted. And maybe you're like that. Maybe you're like Peter who you've just given up. You've put your foot in your mouth. You've made some mistakes. You've made some decisions. You love God, but you just made a decision that wasn't good. But I want to tell you, Jesus restored Peter. Peter's story didn't stop at get behind me, Satan. Maybe you've been corrected. Maybe you've had something happen to you and and you've gone, I just can't deal with this and you've walked away. God wants to restore you just like he restored Peter. How did he restore Peter? He was sitting down at the end when he came back and resurrected, resurrected Jesus just after Easter and he said to Peter, hey, feed my sheep. Love my sheep. And restored him. He gave him a purpose. He gave him the purpose of life. And you see, Peter, there he was then. And then at the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, he comes down and there was a ruckus in the street. Have you ever been to a, par- a place where there's a party on at night? Maybe around your place, yeah, you're just lying in bed. It's one o'clock in the morning. Yeah, you know those things. And there's this bass, the bass player playing, I don't get no satisfaction at the top. <laughs> and you get no satisfaction because you're not sleeping. But everyone knows there's a party on. Yeah? And that's what was happening because 3,000 people turned up at least and they were outside saying, What's going on? You can imagine the noise that all of a sudden these people were, would come out at Jerusalem. And on that, 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus and the church was started. So no matter what you've done, no matter where, you, where you've been, no matter how you've projected Jesus, whether you've denied him, whether you've walked away, God has a plan and a purpose for you. He wants to, you to discover your purpose. 
He wants you to find out who you created to be. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're created in the image of God. And He wants to find you, for you to find your purpose, to make a difference in the world. Because we're called, who likes to make a difference? I notice at funerals, we never talk about how much money people had. We never talk about all that stuff. We talk about, wow, he was a great person. She was a wonderful but She made a difference. We're all looking to be that difference maker. Sometimes because of the things we've done, we've walked away and missed our purpose. Today, Jesus wants to reactivate that in you. He wants to turn you around just like he did with Peter and say, hey, feed my sheep. Hey, discover your purpose. Make a difference. Change the world. That's what Jesus wants to do this Easter for you. Maybe you've been like Peter and you've made the mistakes. You've, you've, you've been full on for God. And don't we see that sometimes? People who are full on for God and all of a sudden something happens and they go cold. God wants to reactivate that in you today. God has a plan for you. No matter what you've done, no matter what, where you've been, he wants you to fulfil your God-given potential. You see, we don't just go to church. We are the church. We are the church. And it's our job to leave the church in a better way than what we found it. Don't you teach that to your kids? The kids borrow something. I was always taught, if you borrow something, you give it back in a better way than when you got it. Well, that's like we should be, that, uh, that we should be giving the church back. We should be a place where we should be engaging. And, and the church isn't the building. The church is the world that we live in, that we are the church. It's, it's not a building, but it's a matter of how do we create a, a place where people are impacted by God, a place where our kids love to come to church, a place where our grandkids, when you're old like me and I want them, if they're watching, um, <laughs> to come and love. That's why this morning your kids, if you've got kids, they're down there. There's a petting zoo and there's jumping castles and lots of chocolates that we're sending, up, sending all your kids home full of sugar. <laughs> but they'll be happy for the first five minutes. Um, no. <laughs> But it's a place where they love God, a place where they encounter God, a place where they, they actually discover, just like Peter did, to love God and know that church is fun. And maybe this morning as we did a rap on Easter, it got in your face a little bit and thought, whoa, that's okay, the kids love it. I loved it. <laughs> maybe I'm just a big kid. Um, <laughs> But why? Because people matter. People matter. We should leave the church in a better way than what it was when we found it. Make a difference in the world. You see, Peter just wanted to keep Jesus to himself. Peter liked what he got. Peter thought, this is great. I've got the Messiah. We're going to take over the world. And I'm one of the 12. He didn't want to give it away. But God, Jesus, Wanted to activate him into his potential, into his call. Jesus has the same heart for you. The last person I want to look at this morning is a unique person. We don't read much about him, but he is one of the villains of the story. Judas. Judas Iscariot. If you don't know the story, Judas is the one who gave up Jesus, identified him, that they could take him away to be crucified. And given that the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, were written, written after the event, so there's probably 60 AD, somewhere around that time, the scriptures were written, the stories were written, they could be kept. And I don't know about you, but this is how I picture it happened. Someone's done something wrong to you, you tend to leave them out of most of the stories, don't you? You do. The reality. I know you're all good Christians. It wouldn't happen. It's just me. So what happens is I just move you across to the left a little bit. Still love you. It's okay. But you're just not in the main storyline anymore. And this, I think, was what happened to Judas. But understand who Judas was. Judas was one of the 12. Judas was there all the time. 
He was there when Jesus walked on the water. He saw Peter get out of the boat. He watched Lazarus being raised. He, he saw amazing miracles. He saw blind eyes open, deaf ears opened. He saw the woman with the issue of blood get healed. He saw demons come out. He saw the, the demoniac who was recorded in the Bible was called Legion. He had so many devils in him. He saw that happen and change. He saw all the pigs run and fall into the sea. This Judas saw it all happen. Incredible how he saw it all, but at somewhere in his journey, his heart got messed up. Judas was the guy that looked after the money. Maybe there was a bit of money coming in and he got a bit of twisted, bitter and twisted about it. And how many times do we see it in church where people get bitter and twisted about money? Maybe Judas was that guy. He just lost his way. I know lots of people like this. Maybe this morning you're like this. Maybe you're someone who's experienced God and you've lost your way. They grew up in, you know, we've grown up in church. I've seen lots of people grow up in church. They believe in Jesus. They get water baptised like we're doing this morning after the service. Where, and they have filled with the Spirit speaking in tongues. They, they've encountered God. They're on fire for God. But something happened where their heart got out of order. Something happened that caused them to walk away. Maybe it was a question, it was at university, which said, how could you believe that? And all of a sudden you thought, how can I believe that? Maybe it was a leader at church who'd done something wrong and you got offended and thought, well, there's a hypocrite. How, do I, how can I deal with this? Maybe it was something that went on that you've read the Bible and you looked at it and thought, I can't reconcile that. Maybe it was a question thrown at you. Maybe it was like Judas who grew up in a religion that was Judaism and he was obviously a good Jewish boy and what he was seeing with Jesus wasn't lining up with his religion and he was wrestling and couldn't wrestle with it. Even though he saw all the miracles, he, he couldn't wrestle it out. Maybe your church experiences and you've come in today and you've gone, what about this place? Maybe it's something that's challenging you. Maybe through your journey, you grew up in a mainline traditional, I did, grew up in a traditional church. And this wrestled and, and the challenge that comes to you to know God, not just know of Him. Matthew 27 says this, then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. See, Judas sold Jesus to the Jews. And he wasn't, probably didn't think they were going to crucify him. Thought, I'm just going to hand him over. I get 30 pieces of silver. It'll be all right. They'll flog him or something. This whole thing will finish. But when he saw what was going to happen, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And he knew he was wrong. And the priests, the ones that he looked up to, the ones that he, you know, was his religion, they said, what do you want us to do? We don't care. Sort it out yourself. And throwing the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hung himself. See, see sometimes regret can take you to the edge of wanting to live. But there's hope. Doubting Thomas was another one who was there. He didn't believe. He said, Jesus, when Jesus reappeared, he said, I want to stick, I'm not even going to believe Jesus has reappeared to you. I want to stick my hands, get my finger and stick it into where the hole, to where the nail went in. Jesus said, off you go. But Judas was so overtaken by regret, he took his life. 
didn't have to take his life. He took his life. He lost his life. And maybe you're in this place and maybe you've done some things that you regret. Maybe you once followed Jesus. Maybe you're in church and you're on fire for God. Maybe there was things, but something happened to you. And you're here today. Jesus wants to restore you. He loves you. You have a future and a hope. That's what the message of Easter is. A future and a hope for you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what regrets you have, no matter what sins you've done, no matter what you've said, Jesus is here to restore you. That is the message of Easter. But will you ask him in? I love the story of the prodigal son, or better still titled the expectant father. Maybe you've been away. Maybe you were just like that. You've got regrets and you've walked away. There's an expectant father waiting for you to restore you, to help you, to make a difference in the world. See, that's what Easter is about. Easter is about you. You matter. Jesus died on the cross with you on his mind. He died on the cross because he knew in 2019 there'd be these people sitting in a church in Toowoomba who are called to make a difference in the world, to give you that you will know him, not just know of him, that you'll discover freedom, that the regrets, the sin, the weight will fall off your life and you'll find that thing called freedom. You find your purpose, to discover your purpose, just like Peter did, where Jesus exposed his purpose to him on this rock of revelation, Peter, I'll build my church, and 3,000 came to know him that day. Whether you've been like Mary, just a good person doing life well, and there's pressure being around you from your family or your friends or God wants to touch you today and establish you and provide for you. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, I'm, I need to go. I know my call is to ministry. I know I'm called. God will make a way. He'll provide for you. It's the story of Mary. Or maybe you're like Judas and you're at the end of your tether right now, the end of your rope, and you're saying, God, I, I, I've done some things that I regret. I've made some decisions. I've denied you. I once walked with you. I once knew you. But now I've allowed my heart, and that's how our inner man to get hard. Jesus wants to restore you, take you onto your future. So I finished this morning, Jeremiah 18. And if you're an artist, you get this picture, if you work with clay, it's just this amazing substance that you can form something with. But it says this, So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel. It seemed good to the potter to do. I want you to catch this from this scripture, no matter where you've been in life, no matter what you've done. That potter, and that's talking of God, didn't throw the clay away. He didn't just take the clay and go, oh, well, it didn't work, threw it away. He grabbed that clay, he put it back on the wheel. He refashioned and reformed it. He created a beautiful vessel. And that vessel he creates, in terms of the prophet, the potter, a pot is about carrying something else. And that's what He wants to do for you. He'll never discard you. The clay was never thrown away. You'll never be thrown away with Jesus, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are. That God wants to grab you this morning 
And He wants to put you on that wheel and shape you to your future and your hope. That you'll discover your purpose and you'll make a difference in the world. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for every person here this morning. Father, this Easter, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, Lord, whether they are a Mary who's just been a beautiful person all their life, who've done some things for you that people don't understand, ones that are working out how they're going to do ministry, how they're going to do life, Father, bless them this morning. Father, whether they're a Peter and they know you and, Father, there's times they've rejected you, they've walked away in the workplace, at the school, at the university. They've said, oh, no, rejected. Father, that you want to restore them to their greatness and their purpose. Or maybe they're a Judas, Lord, today. And they've just lost hope. They, they were once in church. They were once worshipping. They were once someone who was on fire, who'd seen things happen, but something happened to their heart. Father, I pray that you touch them today, that they know you, not just know of you. Father, that people will know God, find freedom, discover their purpose and make a difference in their world and the world around them. The message of Easter, just while every eye is closed and every head's bowed today. We do this every service and it's just so important. But I want to create a place for you right now that you can take your next step. While no one's looking around, just you and God. You see, it's to know Jesus, not just know of Him. So often we know of Him, we don't know Him. I'd love to help you take your next step this morning and ask Jesus into your life.